in control. As you, you may or may not recall, the third point of my message, let me get my notes all together here. The third point of my message is that God will providentially intervene for a righteous man's request if the intervention would be consistent with God's plans and goals. That is, it would it be wise and loving that he could intervene. And uh, I want to make it very clear. God made the earth for man. Commanded that Noah, first he commanded Adam and Eve to rule over it. Those are very significant words. Rule means it's your domain. You have to be governed, self-governed first, and govern anybody that will not govern you themselves. Right? So that's the whole idea of rule has very significant terminology. Then when after the flood, of course, man said, I'm not going to rule over myself. And it got so bad that God had to take, he had to take things, uh, we would say, unilaterally. Uh, he did find one man in his family that he could save, but he had to destroy the whole earth. Which was, the Bible says it grieved him at his heart. Pastor Harvey said that that Hebrew word grieved means kind of like he couldn't get his breath, he was so broken hearted over this. He didn't want to do this, but sin brought, he was kind of cornered, he had no, no, no other way out of this thing but to destroy everything that he had made. And folks, you, we think we have a beautiful world, this is my father's world, oh, you have no idea what it was like before the flood. I'm certain that when Noah and his family got off, they probably broke into tears. I just, I'm writing a paper, I just wrote a paper in the book of Ezra. When they built, when they laid the foundation of the temple, it says the people shouted with joy, but all the old priests and Levites that remembered the former te temple, they wept. Why? Because all thought is comparative. They compared what they just put down with what had been there. The big pieces of marble that Samson, Solomon had brought. And I'm sure they were polished to a high sheen and had all these beautiful you know, marble that's so beautiful when it's properly cut and polished. And so they saw the rocks, which they were, they were glad that they were rebuilding it, but it was so pathetic, if you will, relatively speaking, compared to what had been there, that they broke out in weeping. The Bible says that the, south, the sound of the... Remember, Jerusalem's on a mountaintop. So the temple would have been on top of a mountain. It said the sound of crying and shouting for joy went for many a long distance. People all around heard this sound of these people who some of them happy because they didn't they'd never seen the old temple. Others kind of a bittersweet. They were happy because they were rebuilding it, but they were sad because of what they lost. And remember, folks, you remember Humpty Dumpty. Matthew, you remember Humpty Dumpty? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Who couldn't put him back together again? That's right. And folks, let me tell you something. You have a free will. You can make choices in life. But you can't put back together once you make a choice. There's certain things you can never get back. Amen? Mm -hmm. Now, God will forgive you if you sin against Him, and I hope you won't. You don't never need to, Angela. Kristen. You don't ever need to sin against God. Matthew, same goes for you. You can live a holy life. Don't say, well, God will forgive me. That's called presumptuous sinning. Say, well, I'll just do it and God will forgive me. You know there's no guarantee in the Bible that God will forgive presumptuous sin. Do you know that? There's no guarantee. You, you can't find a verse that says, well, you go ahead and sin and I'll forgive you. In fact, Joshua tells the people of Israel in the 24th chapter of Joshua, he says, if you people go into this land and you begin to worship other gods, God will never forgive you. He actually says that. He will never forgive you. And by the way, God says that. He says it in Deuteronomy. If a man does this, I'll never forgive him. He goes and worships other gods and begins to lead the people away from the Lord their God. I will never forgive you. By the way, there is an unpardonable sin, isn't there? What is it? Blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. Jesus Himself said it. There's, there, don't, don't assume or presume, presume 
that God will forgive you if you sin. Don't you do it. Because there's no guarantee in the Bible that he ever will. So don't do it. Now, where, I, how did I get there? Let's see if I can trade. I can't even remember. Nope, no way. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, God will providentially intervene. So I want to talk about God's providence. Now, my wife, uh, Neil has been, he's been desperately asking for the messages to be on YouTube so he can show them on his TV in his home rather than Facebook. <laughs> Because you can stop YouTube. So I want to be able to stop it and discuss things that the pastor says. He brought up, he said, well, because he knows about this, he is God in control. So he brought up the fact that the Bible, he didn't give any verses, but he said the Bible says that God numbers our days. How many of you have heard that? You know, we have it. It's common. People say, well, God, you know, well, it was his time. Well, it was the end of the world. So... I said to Paul, well, ask Neil, and by the way, Neil, if you're watching this, you know, you're important to us, you and your family. Uh, I, I knew, I pretty much knew which verse he's referring to, so turn to Psalm chapter 139. This is a passage that you, I'm, I'm going over this because somebody's going to throw this up in your face, okay? Dave's probably already dealt with this, so Dave, I need your help here on this to explain this properly. Psalm 139, verse, we'll start at verse 12. Now remember, David is writing poetry. Got that? So we need to remember, as one of the things you, when you study the Bible, you consider what kind of literature you're dealing with. Okay? Jesus taught in what? Parables. Allegories are used. But you have to be very careful what you're talking. This is poetic. Uh, literature, therefore poetic license or poetic language is often used in poetry, isn't it? To make things rhyme or to make an allusion to something. Here's what it says, verse 12. Even the darkness is not dark to you. David the psalmist is talking to God. Even the darkness is not dark to you and the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. It's interesting because the Bible says heaven is... Who's the light of heaven? Jesus. Jesus, the Lamb. So there's no darkness in heaven. By the way, it means there's no shadows. Right? So, verse, uh, verse 13. For you formed my inward parts, you wove me in my mother's womb. What's the context? Analogy. What? Analogy. Darkness. Okay, he's making an analogy. But what's... The context is gestation. You know what gestation is? That's when the embryo, an egg, is fertilized in the womb and becomes an embryo. And the process of development of a fetus and of a human being begins in the womb. Now, see what he's saying there? You wove me in my mother's womb. So he's talking about when he was in his mother's womb. I don't think you have to be a lit, lit uh, major, do you, Sarah, to understand that? All right, verse 14. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows this very well. By the way, every soul knows this very well, not just David's soul. Amen? All you got to do is look at yourself in the mirror and know that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. I was just telling, we were working on some things with, with our hands, John and I, Saturday, and I said, isn't it amazing that God gave us a brain that runs these hands? You know, they've been trying to make robotic hands for years, and it's very it's probably the most difficult thing for them to try to engineer is how do you do a robotic hand? Because it's, there's things that it can do that you think, well, how, how can it pick up that little tiny thing? So... I, I wonder, now verse 15, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret. Where would that be, that he was made in secret? In his mother's womb. Amen? And skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Well, we know that has to be poetic license, right, Sarah? Because no human beings are made in the depths of the earth. Got it? But inside the womb, the idea is it's like in the middle of, where, where'd you come from? 
Well, there again, there's exactly the idea of poetic license. Verse 16, your eyes have seen my unformed substance. Now, by the way, how can God see your unformed substance? Well, there's this thing called DNA. Everybody know about DNA? You familiar with it? What is on DNA? Well, every physical aspect is on DNA. Your hair color, your eye color, your skin color, everything, your your physique. It's the instruction book. It's 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 a code that tells the cells what they're going to be. When you know, if you're going to be a heart cell, you're going to be a, a bone cell. Or, it's all code. It's all written on this unbelievable thing called, and God knows how to read it because He created it. So he can tell in the womb if you're going to be a boy or a girl just by reading your code. What color your hair is supposed to be now. Angela kind of helped it out there a little bit. But I mean the point is, it's all written. Everything, everything is written. And God can read it, Brother Gene. So he, David says, you might, your eyes have seen my unformed substance. And in your book are written all the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. And here's the bingo. Oh, God's already decided how long I'm going to live and when I'm going to die. Well, isn't it more reasonable to say God ordained how many days you're going to be in your mother's womb? What's the period for gestation? The average period? Nine months. Nine, everybody knows that. Nine months. God ordained that. He ordained that when He built the DNA into human beings. Well, actually, He had to do that when He made a woman, right? Because they're the ones that have to take care of this problem. Adam didn't have that. He didn't have that code on his DNA. God had to kind of fix that up when He made Eve. But the point is, this can be the context demands that your days being numbered are the days in the womb, not the days you're going to live on earth, because you haven't even been born yet. You understand? And yet people will take this one verse 16 out of context and say, see, God knows how long I'm going to live on earth. Well, I say there's a different, more rational, more uh, biblically sound way of saying it. God knows how many days you're going to be in the womb. If all goes well, the normal time period. So, does anybody have anything else to contribute or disagree with? Does that make sense? Yes, Bill. There is a, a verse in the Bible where I believe God says your days will be 70 years or something like that, right? I looked and looked for that last night. But let me show you some other verse. Well, well, my, my point was going to be, even if that is... Yes. Need, need, Works on the law of averages, like yes. right? we do, kind of. We, we make these statements, but they're broad, they're not specific. Right. Let me read some other verses that kind of go right along with what you just said. Uh, Exodus 20, 12. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be prolonged or long upon the earth. Now, wait a minute. If God numbers your days then it doesn't, shouldn't matter if you honor your father or mother, right? I mean, you, yeah, Dr. Aiden actually goes, yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. It's kind of a good point to me. I hope, I thought, I hope somebody else thinks the way I do. And that, that is repeated Deuteronomy 5.16. Honor your father or mother. Days may be prolonged. Deuteronomy 6.2. He says, so that you and your son and your grandsons might fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. And uh, Deuteronomy 25, 15, the same thing. That your days may... Make sure you have an equal scale or an equal weight. Don't cheat people in the grocery store. Or in the car dealership. That your days may be prolonged, which the Lord gives you. Then Psalm 89, 45 says, You have shortened the days of his youth. Hmm, that's interesting. I thought God knew, knew the number of days. Why would he have to shorten them? Well, you see. Uh, Psalm 102.23 He has weakened my strength in the way he has shortened my days. And uh, Proverbs 10.27 The fear of the Lord prolongs life. 
but the years of the wicked will be shortened. So the idea that God has a specific number of days laid out for you before you're ever born is not biblical. I, I couldn't find any verses other than this 100, Psalm 139. Now, uh, in, turn to Psalm 90. It's an interesting uh, verse. My wife and I used to sing this as a, this is a scripture chorus we used to sing all the time. Psalm 90, verse 12. <clears throat> the psalmist is praying to God, asking Him, So teach us to number our days, that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. Now what does it mean to number our days? Is the psalmist asking God to reveal to him when he will die? Now this conclusion would be irrational and nonsensical, right? Okay, God, tell me what day I'm going to die. By the way, the only guy that knew that was who? Who's the only guy that ever knew what day he was going to die? Hezekiah. Hezekiah. Why? 15. So yeah, you can bet there was a big calendar in the royal palace. <laughs> Why wouldn't you? So he knew 15 years from that day, because God doesn't mess around. 15 years of that, that's when you're going to die. I wouldn't want to know that, by the way. I don't know about you, but I, I wouldn't want, that wouldn't be something I'd like to know. Uh, it is more understandable and logical that we should ask God to help us and show us how to be more effective with the days which we have on earth. That is, not to waste our lives on useless and worthless effort, efforts, you understand? Teach us to number our days, to take them into account. I wish I had never sinned and wasted those years in selfishness. If I can do it over again, I would have just given my heart to Christ when I was your age, Jordan, and said, God, I'm going to serve you. Whatever you got for me to do, I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to obey God. I'm not going to do anything to ever disappoint you. I wouldn't have wasted one day living for myself. I regret ever being selfish. I wish I hadn't. Many times I tell God, I'm so sorry I'm selfish. I wish I just lived for you. I wasted all those good years. You know. I did not number my days when I youth. Now Solomon admonishes young people, Ecclesiastes 12.1. Remember also your Creator in the days of your youth. Before what? Well, before you get old. Before the evil days come and the years draw near when you will say, I have no delight. So when you get old, you say, I wish I could do those things, but I don't delight in doing those things anymore. I get room, I get sore, I get full of pain. I, I can't do the things I used to do. Amen. You wish you could, Mary, she still tries to, even though she shouldn't, then she regrets it after she does it. So Young people, remember thou thy creator in the days of your youth. Don't waste your youth on, on dissipation and just wasted life. Amen? Please, do what's right. Do what's good. Honor God. So, anybody got any comments about this number of your days? Okay. We want to speak about providential government. So I gave you a chart today, Mark. Matt, Mark was over there going, providential government. And it, sadly, we don't, that term is not a common term. As it, well, 150 years ago in this country, providential government was understood, preached about, talked about people. It was a common term, but it's not so common anymore. So, Jeremiah chapter 18 is the text I'm using, starting at verse 1. Now, who, when did Jeremiah live? <clears throat> At what point in the history of Israel did Jeremiah live? After Babylon or during that period? Right before the captivity in Babylon. So he was the last prophet before the exile in Judah. Now who was his counterpart? Ezekiel, who was in Susa. He, he was actually already been exiled and lived thousand miles away, but they, they wrote letters to each other. They were contemporaries with each other. So here's what happened with Jeremiah, verse 1, chapter 18. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, quote, Arise, and go down to the potter's house, 
And there I will announce my words to you. And he obeyed. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, making something on the wheel. But the vessel that he was making of clay was spoiled in the hand of the potter, so he remade it into another vessel. Some Either he found a piece of defective clay, or his hand moved just the wrong way, and the thing that went out of balance, if you've ever, ever seen a wheel, and of course these were wheels that were, you when the motor hooked to, you had to kick it with your feet. I, bu I built one for a young gal a number of years ago. It was really nice. Of course I had bearings and steel stuff. But everything worked great. She could sit on this little bench and she got that thing going and she could form. Uh, and I had a maple top I made on it. It was really beautiful. Uh, so he's, he says the potter made it into what he pleased to make it. Then verse 5. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, Can I not, O house of Israel, deal with you as this potter does, declares the Lord? Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. Now, most people just stop right there. See? <laughs> Why, God can do anything He wants to do. Isn't that right? That's what they do. They stop right there. Folks, don't, don't stop. Keep reading. It's always important. If, if something is puzzling to you, just keep reading. So God explains what He means. <clears throat> At one moment, verse 7, I might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to uproot, to pull down, or to destroy it. If, the biggest little word in the English language, if that nation against which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent or repent uh, concerning the calamity I plan to bring on it. Is that clear enough to everybody? God sends a prophet. Remember Jonah? Forty days, and Nineveh shall be destroyed. Was it? No. 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 Why? Because they changed their mind. That's right. They didn't just, they didn't just change their mind. They put, they, put, they put sackcloth and ashes on every donkey, on every doggy, on every little sheep in the whole city, including the king. And they said, the king said, who knows? Perhaps... God will relent. They didn't know for sure. They're just hoping that God will be merciful. Perhaps God, he might relent. What's that, Aiden? I didn't know what that was. Jonah, the book of Jonah. Oh, it's great. I tell you what, that's, I'm, so, I'm not surprised you don't know it because no, most people don't want to read that book because it, all that is is just like throwing a great big stone on Calvinism. Yeah. That's really what it does. Because it's very, very clear in this book that God changes his mind and says, well, I'm not going to do what I said I was going to do. Well, if he foreknew that, why would he tell him? You understand the problem here. It's a, big, it's a big conundrum, if you will. Okay, verse 9. Or, at another moment I might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to build up or to plant it. If it does evil in my sight by not obeying my voice, then I will think better of the good with which I had promised to bless it. Okay? So God's very clear. God's blessing or curse depends on who? God or man? Yeah. It depends on man. By the way, does God ever want to curse anybody? Absolutely not. He's a God of love. That's inconsistent with the Scriptures. God wants to bless everybody. Jesus even said, well, God even blesses His enemies. He causes the rain to fall on the rotten guy's farm and on the good guy's farm. He causes the sun to shine on the rotten guy's farm and on the good guy's farm. Amen? God doesn't want to send anybody to hell. The Bible says He's not willing that any should perish. But, you know, I'm convinced most people who believe this stuff, oh, no, God, God wants all the sinners to go to hell. Calvinism actually teaches God's already predestined some people to go to hell. Can you imagine that? Why anybody would ever want to believe that, I have no earthly idea. He wants everybody to go to heaven. By the way, he's got plenty of room. He's not, God's never going to run out of room. He can just add on there to heaven, you know, break, you know, make the walls bigger and put some more schools and streets down. Not a big problem at all for God. He's got plenty of construction materials. He's got plenty of guys ready to do the work. No, no issue. So he wishes everybody would be there. Not that he's not willing any, not one, should perish. 
Now, how do we define providential government? Well, here's Webster's, and I found this to be a very good de uh, description, definition. The care and superintendence, God's a superintendent, if you will, which God exercises over... Did, is there not enough sheets for everybody? We used to get one. Okay. Uh, exercises over his creatures that he acknowledges, he that acknowledges a creation and denies a providence involves himself in a palpable contradiction. Now you understand what that is. If you see, you've heard of deism before, you ever heard of the deistic thinking? Deism purports that God made everything, set it in motion, and then he just went and said, I'm taking it easy, I'm so tired, I'm not going to mess with it anymore, just let it go. Well, that's not true. That's a palpable contradiction. Somebody who took the effort and made the time to make this world is going to be involved in it. Amen? He has a purpose. He didn't, God just didn't do it just to look good. He did it to derive something from His creation, which is to be expected. I mean, everybody that starts his own business wants something out of it besides just the satisfaction of being able to do it. He wants a profit. By the way, it's not a dirty word. Don't let anybody ever convince you, young people, that socialism's the way to go. No, no, capitalism is, Christian capitalism is the only way to fly. Okay? There is no other way. God established it, by the way. Read Deuteronomy 18, verse 8. Now, uh, he says, if it's a palpable contradiction to say that God created it, but denies involvement or the care of it, for the same power which caused a thing to exist is necessary to continue its existence. Hebrews chapter 1 says that God, that the Son upholds all things by the word of His power. So we are sustained today because of the word of God, the power of God. That's the only reason we're sustained here. When we, man, we talk, you know, this big, this big thing with young people, sustainability. Hey folks, without God there's no sustainability. It all is just going to evaporate. Poof! Which is going to happen someday, isn't it? Not with water, but it's going to be evaporated with fire, the Bible says. Now some persons admit to a general providence, but deny a particular providence, not considering that a general providence consists of particulars. And that's good thinking, good sound thinking. A belief in Divine providence is a source of great consolation to good men and properly understood a true picture of God Himself. Amen? Aren't you glad that God's on the throne of heaven? <coughs> I'm glad. I, wouldn't, I don't want to be on it. I'll tell you that. Satan was a fool. He didn't have the, he didn't have the capabilities to run the universe. Only God has the capabilities to run the universe. So I'll tell you what I get up every morning. I'm glad he's the king of the universe, folks. And I know that as long as I put my faith in him, I got it made. Amen? That's, that's what we ought to do. Now, we may divide providential government into four categories. First, human government. Romans chapter 13, verse 1. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Now, I make a little note here. This does not mean that God approves of every decision human government makes. Amen? It just states that God has established human government as the way things operate on this earth. But it doesn't mean He goes along with everything. So it's important for us to remember. God gave man the responsibility of governing other men who would not govern themselves. He commanded Noah, Genesis 9, Surely I will require your lifeblood from every beast I will require. And from every man, and from every man's brother I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood by man, his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. So the reason... Humans have to govern other humans is because some of them are uncontrolled. They will not control themselves. So it requires that other humans control them. It's not God. You know, J Joyce was saying in Sunday school, and it's a perplexing issue. Well, God did all these things for the Israelites. Why didn't He just wipe these people out or make them purple or something? You know, do something to them. Well, because it's our job. 
It's our job as humans. And I realize it's, it's an imperfect system. Listen, why, why do we have problems in human government? Because man sinned. Because man decided to go his own way. And God says, I, if, if only you had just done what I commanded you to do, it would be so different. But he, man did it. Now, God, uh, God gave, he gave man the divine parameters of human government in the Ten Commandments. Isn't that right? Force may be a function of human government. Not, it's not the best way, but that it may be. Sometimes it's necessary to use force, isn't it, in human government. But God, the Ten Commandments are the basic structure to make human government work properly upon the earth. And you know, it's interesting, if you look at the laws of our nation, they're all based on the Ten Commandments. Someone says, well, how do you know that? Well, because in the apex of the Supreme Court building, in, in the U.S. Supreme Court building in Washington, D.C., right there in the, in the crown of the roof is what? A bath? No, a bass relief, a sculpture of Moses holding the Ten Commandments. Isn't that interesting? In our Supreme Court building, we have a picture, permanent picture, of Moses holding the Ten Commandments. One of the reasons Charles Finney was converted is he had, as a lawyer, he had to study Blackstone. Now, Blackstone was an English jurist who was, at, in the early the colonial days, was the, Bi the Bible, if you will, for courts and judicial uh, systems, okay? Everybody studied Blackstone. And you know what Blackstone uses for all as proof or as weight or evidence for his uh, his premises? Bible verses. He uses examples from the scriptures. So Finney said, I was reading the Bible by studying Blackstone because you couldn't escape it. Now, of course, we gutted our legal system from any biblical references because that would be mixing church and state. Oh, don't get me started. I got <laughs> All right, look at the next column. Divine government or moral government? Psalm 18, go ahead, Gene. I know you're dying to say something, but you won't forget it. Sorry. Yeah, uh, Romans 13, 1, you probably ought to discuss that a little further, especially in light of where, where we at in our nation. Right. Because uh, a lot of people think that, you know, you have to abide by everything the government says to do. And uh, God's laws are above Absolutely. Laws. And the laws that are being made today are, are decrees, if you want to call it, whatever you want to call those things that Biden does, uh, is totally opposed to what God says. Amen. And uh, uh, I spent some time uh, debating a guy from South Africa uh, on uh, the idea that, you know, that God raises up and puts down, and he, he quotes about Nebuchadnezzar, you know, how... how My servant did, Nebuchadnezzar. Right, and how he made him eat grass and stuff, and, and of course he thought after that, you know, God's in control, he's doing all these things, you know, and he raises up and lets down. But if you read Hosea 4, he said, you, you set princes up and kings and stuff that I didn't know about. Right. Right. In other words, uh, God didn't have a hand in that. Right. So uh, people need to understand that because something appears to be stuff, like in Romans 13, 1, uh, and they take that and run with it and don't balance it out with the other scripture. Right. <laughs> and use common sense. You, you're, so Paul is simply stating in Romans 13 that God's the one that established government. Right. He doesn't say that God caused every law that was made to be made, like, you know, pro-abortion laws and pro-homosexual marriage laws. No, of course not. He just simply established human government. And he did that in Genesis chapter 9. You know, he who sheds man's blood, by man's blood shall he be shed. I, I think that's all Paul's talking about. Now, he does go on farther to say in Romans 13, we should be subject to the government, pay your taxes. But remember, as Gene has said, in Acts chapter 5, when the disciples are called in before the Sanhedrin and commanded to stop preaching in Jesus' name, what do they say? They say, hey, you have to decide whether it's right or not. But as for us, 
We're going to obey God. We're not going to obey you. you got that? So, we, we, and we Christians should have, these scriptural Christians, we should know the Bible well enough to know when, uh-uh, I'm not crossing that line. Sorry, I'm, I'm not doing that. Bill, do you have anything to add? All right. Psalm, back over to this divine covenant of world government. Psalm 18, 25, 26. With the kind, you show yourself kind. With the blameless, you show yourself blameless. With the pure, you show yourself pure. And with the crooked, you show yourself astute. How does God govern? Well, not he's not a dictator. He will not cause a free moral agent to exercise his will against his motive. Now, there are cases in the Bible, for instance, with Pharaoh. If, he always made this distinction. Oh, oh, that's, I think it might be a little fast. Oh, maybe not. Dean always made this distinction. Pharaoh hardened his heart three or four times before God hardened his heart. So God didn't take a guy that had a soft, humble, pliable heart and harden his heart against his will, his motive. You understand that? God only did that because Pharaoh had that disposition already. And of course he said, I did that to judge them. And there's, uh, there's several other places, you know, the story of uh, Micaiah and these prophets that are telling Ahab and Jehoshaphat that they should go out and win the battle. And Micaiah says, well, I, I, was, I saw the host of heaven sitting around the throne and somebody said, well, who will go down and entice Ahab to go out so I can put, it, put him to death? And he, the spirit came forth and said, I'll go down and be a lying spirit in the mouth of the prophets. God says, go ahead and do it. Now, did God, were these righteous prophets? And then this spirit made them lie? Well, they were already liars. So God just induced them, persuaded them to lie some more. You understand? So this is an important point. God will never, and I, I, I thought of a couple exceptions, so I'm, I'm going to bring them up because I'm an honest preacher. I'm not going to try to hide anything. You remember when Saul heard that David was with Samuel at Naboth, or Nabioth, and so he goes out to get him. And the Bible says that, that the Spirit of God came over him and he laid down naked and prophesied and laid down naked all night. So that one's kind of a tough one for me because his motive was to kill David. He wanted to go kill David. But the, he, he starts prophesying with the prophets and then he takes his clothes off and he lays down naked all night. So I don't quite understand that one. The second one that I kind of have a... You could help me, please, if you can think of it, is when Caiaphas... Remember, he prophesied, oh, he says, you don't know, of one man, it's better for one man to die for the people. And the Bible says that he, because he said that, because he was high priest, that's why he prophesied or said that. He, he wanted Jesus dead. There's no doubt about that. He, he was not sympathetic with Jesus. So, Dave, can you, you have any insight into those two things versus what we've just said here, that God never causes someone to do something against their motive. Maybe you don't. I don't, I don't put anybody on the spot. But if you think of something, let me know. Let me keep reading here. Now, he can cause a free moral agent to act in concert with his motive, which I already pointed out. But this cause does not eliminate accountability because the motive is his own. In other words, when God hardened Pharaoh's heart, God wasn't... Mo Pharaoh was still accountable. Why? Well, because he hardened his heart three or four times to start with, you understand. So he was still accountable under those rules, if you will. Now, God hardens the hard-hearted, but never hardens the heart of a soft or humble person. Here's Joshua 11.20. For it was the Lord, for it was of the Lord to harden their hearts, to meet Israel in battle, in order that he might utterly destroy them that they might receive no mercy, but that he might destroy them just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Now, these people that came against Israel already had hard hearts. Remember, when they came to Jericho, did the city have the gates open and come out with the uh, juice and crackers? Welcome! We know you just had a long journey. No, what was the city? It was closed up tighter than a drum, wasn't it? And they had all the spears up there. 
And of course, I think probably started laughing after these people. What are they doing marching around here so every day? Can you imagine? That part might have been kind of nerve-wracking too, though, in some sense. So the people certainly of the land, remember what uh, Rahab says to the spies, she says, our hearts have melted away. We have no courage left in us whatsoever. We're scared to death of you people. So they weren't about to leave the land. So that verse is there. Anybody got any comments so far? Anybody think of anything else? All right, turn over the back page. Part of providence, that divine providence, is the government of cause and effect. Psalm 135, 6 through 7. Whatever the Lord pleases, He does in heaven and in earth, in the seas and in all deeps. He causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth, who makes lightnings for the rain, who brings forth the wind from His treasures. Treasuries. Treasuries. All right. So you see, in the physical world, in the world of atoms, elements. God can, well, he brought a flood, didn't he, upon the whole earth. He, uh, you know, so God, he can operate by the law of cause and effect. And here's some examples. Now God rules over physical non-animate realm by fiat, decree, or by default physical laws which he ordained and established. You don't ever have to worry if the sun's going to come up tomorrow. Why? Because it comes, it's come up every day for how many centuries? So it's going to come up tomorrow. God's established certain laws. Amen? And the whole universe operates. God does not have to... Gene said that Sproul, R.C. Sproul, uh, actually said that if one... He said if there's one rogue molecule in the whole universe... We can't depend on any of God's promises. <laughs> now, folks, don't listen to this That's guy. That's a quote, by the way. I gotta, I'm it's convinced God's going to gonna have a special hot box for him, and you know where. Because I don't see how that guy's going to ever get in. Uh, God has established certain laws, and they, they operate based upon the principles that he has put into, into uh, use, okay? And we can depend on it. That's the way our world is made. Now, he can suspend or reverse these laws if necessary. Joshua 10, 12 through 14. And Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the sons of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, so he didn't do this privately, he did this out loud in front of Israel, O sun, stand still at Gibeon, and O moon, in the valley of Agilon. So the sun stood still, and the moon stopped until the nation avenged themselves of their enemies, is it not written in the book of Jasher? I did have a copy of that for a while, the book of Jasher. I don't any longer. And the sun stopped in the middle of the sky and did not hasten to go down for about a whole day. There was no day like that before it or after it when the Lord listened to the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. And then, of course, we already mentioned Hezekiah. Hezekiah asked for a sign. Because, you know, he... Pray to God, please don't let me die. So Isaiah turns around, didn't even get out of the courtroom, uh, 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 the uh, courtyard of the palace. God says, go back, tell Hezekiah, I'll give him 15 more years. So he said, what do you want for a sign? You want the sun to go up the steps 10 steps or down the steps? And of course, Hezekiah said, well, it always goes one direction, so have it go the opposite direction. And that's what happened. The sun act, God had to stop the universe and back it up in order for the shadow to go up ten steps. I'm saying, well, that's not possible. With God, oh, well, He made it. He can stop it. He can start it back up. He can make it go backwards. Don't ever think He can. I believe this. He did. He stopped the whole universe and backed it up to go up the ten. Because I'm a geocentrist, so I don't believe the. I believe the Earth is stationary in the civil universe. Then the universe is traveling around the earth. And by the way, Isaac Newton thought that was a possibility too. It never got in his book Principia, but it, it is, he did have a last chapter that says that. So I mean, you may think I'm nuts, but I think I'm right. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's that one. Now, government, uh, finish, let's just finish this one up. This other one. Government of non-moral animate instinct. Do I understand instinct? Jeremiah 8. 6 through 7, I have listened and heard. I have spoken what is not right. You, They have spoken what is not right. No man repented of his wickedness, saying, 
What have I done? Everyone turned to his course. Now God is speaking of Israel here, or Judah, specifically Judah. Like a horse charging into battle. Even the stork in the sky knows her seasons. What's that mean? Well, apparently storks fly off somewhere for the winter. Like the geese do. You know how the geese do? They are onk, onk and back the other way now. And they fly south. Apparently storks, I did a little research, storks do the same thing. And the turtle dove and the swift and the thrush observe the time of their migration. You know, some of these birds fly thousands of miles over the ocean to a particular place in Kappa, what do they call the swallows of Capistrano. Are you familiar with the swallows of Capistrano? No? no. Educate yourself this week. They actually, they fly across thousands of uncharted water to a place in, I think it's Mexico, Capistrano, Mexico, or somewhere down south, America. every year, and then they fly back. Look at salmon. Do you know that salmon go upstream to the very place where they were born and lay their eggs there and die? Oh, yeah. And they, they know, they know, they, they, man can't even figure this out. So, so do the butterflies. Yeah, but, oh, look at the monarch butterfly. Flies to a place in Mexico every year. Oh, it's unbelievable. You, you study these migration paths. These are all instinct. Now, God had designed and implemented a myriad of instinctual patterns in insects, fish, and mammals, which are beyond... You know, look, at a, look for a uh, dung beetle. Go on YouTube and type in dung, D-U-N-G, beetle. It's the most amazing thing you will ever see, folks. It really is. Which are beyond man's intelligent capacities to exhaustively discover, explain, and understand. And believe me, they're above man's. They've been studying it for years, and they can't figure these things out completely. These innate powers exceed the most technical advances of man's curiosity and intelligence. Genesis 9, 1 through 2. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. The fear of you and the terror of you will be on every beast of the earth and on every bird of the sky with everything that creeps in the ground and all the fish of the sea into your hand they are given. So why did God put the fear of animals, fear of man into animals? To make it fair. Well, that was after the flood. That's after the flood. Why? Why did you have to do this? Because before the flood they didn't eat meat. No. There was no such thing as a carnivore. Everybody were herb of herbivores. But after the flood, the fruit, the vegetables were not sufficient to sustain man's life. So God had to make a change. Look, sin messes everything up. So he said, now now, by the way, the pets were their friends. And the, the animals were their pets and their friends before the flood. But now God says, I've got I to put an instinct in them to run when they see a man. Now we've sort of domesticated some of the animals, haven't we? But you know, it doesn't make any difference. I've seen a cow kick a farmer clear across the other side of the barn if you come up behind him and scare him. I've actually seen them kick them. I think some farmers have died from being kicked by a cow. That actually has happened. So no matter how domesticated they are, they're still a wild animal and God put the instinct of fear. If you startle these animals, they'll, they'll, they'll turn. Dogs, they, dogs have even turned on their masters because of fear. Of course, we have the story of Balaam's donkey, which we talked about. You're all familiar with that. The angel, he, the donkey, Balaam doesn't see the angel with the sword, but the donkey does, and he's scared. He's frightened. And he lays down a couple of times, and Balaam beats him. Finally, the donkey says, hey, what are you doing? I just saved your neck. Proving, by the way, that the animals did talk before the flood, probably, and lost that power uh, after the flood. So... This, this is what we call providential government. Now, is anybody in closing, anybody got anything to say? All right, would you take this and study it this week, and then we'll, we'll, we'll make some other points next week, all right? Father in heaven, we thank you for your goodness to us. You're such a great God.